Hello everyone, this is Professor Hill. This is a short video for our class introduction to Ethics Philosophy 2306 here at St. Philip's College. This is the online edition of the class for the fall 2018 semester. And today is, wait for it, Wednesday the 31st. It's Halloween. Um, and yes, we did have a great lecture yesterday by Professor Fuller, our kind of annual traditional Halloween philosophy lecture which was a lot of fun, the history of vampire lore. But uh, today, we're looking ahead to our case study along with our IHL readings. Now, I put some readings about international humanitarian law, IHL, into the module for this week. And, um, and I'll send out a link to that so you can see exactly what the readings are because the readings are not from our textbook, Doing Ethics by Louis Vaughn. Now we're switching to materials that I've posted up at the Canvas page about international humanitarian law. This is all from the Red Cross, uh, specifically the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, Switzerland. But, um, but a lot of it has to do with an overview of IHL, and that is a guide for not only legal decisions, but also for us, a reflection on the humanitarian values that underscore this entire framework of laws. Because our interest primarily is what's ethical. And we're talking about are these things good or bad, right and wrong, and why? And that's why this makes for an interesting case, our case study, the case about Baha Musa. Now, as you read through the case study, you'll see that it's a true story, it's a tragic terrible story. Um, and I've included it for a number of different reasons, not least of which is um, I wanted to start with a military story that was contemporary, um, a true story, and one that raised some issues around this whole debate between consequentialism and non-consequentialism in terms of a framework for looking at what happened here. Um, I also want to start with the fact that the British troops that were involved in this situation had been in the field a long time, except for the doctor. Um, they were under tremendous stresses and the conditions in which they were uh, fighting. They were under constant threat. It was an extraordinarily dangerous situation. And in these situations, there's a strong sense of camaraderie and loyalty among the troops who are facing a common enemy, their lives literally in each other's hands. And when, as you see, they react to the violent death of their leader, of one of their troops, they come out um, in what's already a high-pressure, dangerous situation, they come out, start looking for answers, trying to find out who did this, who placed the IED, the explosive device that killed their leader. And again, these guys are upset and angry, and they're, they're, they're having perhaps what are understandable emotional reactions. But that's exactly why we have this framework of laws. And there's a lot of different competing sources of authority that govern troops while they're there. They have their own rules of engagement from their military. They also have this larger framework of international humanitarian law. And of course, they also are responding to changing facts on the ground and the situation in front of them. And of course, they also have their own personal moral beliefs about what's right and wrong, good and bad. Now, um, in this case, as you'll see, there's a young doctor who's very inexperienced who gets put into the middle of this situation and doesn't know what to do. Uh, and he has some, again, competing sources of authority as his own professional, practical, ethical code to follow as a doctor, as well as also the fact that he's a military doctor. So he has one set here for being a physician, one set over here for being a soldier. Um, so there's 
we, we got to sort our way through all of the guidelines that these folks operating again in extraordinary difficult circumstances are required to follow and then talk about why they're required to follow them. Um, it's one of these cases where you might be tempted to say to yourself, well, I don't want to judge these folks because they were under extraordinarily difficult cir circumstances. And you're right, the situation was bad. But it's also when we need the guidelines the most is so that, you know, people don't feel like they're having to make all the decisions on their own in a split second. They need to know that, well, look, we're just operating within this kind of box. And there's some decisions we can't make because they're off limits. That's one of the roles of IHL, especially in a situation like this one. So think about what would you have done, why, but also make judgments about the actors, about the troops, about the doctor. Um, did they do the right thing? If so, why? And again, this is one of these things to where they thought they were acting in a consequentialist manner. They thought, we need this outcome. We need this information. We need to respond in this way to get to make ourselves safe. And really, I think also in response to the killing of our leader. But then there's also the rules. There's the, you know, the non-consequentialist side, which says, no, look, there's rules and you got to follow them. And it also raises this question for us about, about in the military, we have to remember that members of the military are required to follow legal orders. It's not just all orders. They're required to follow legal orders. And if that order is not legal, they're not only not required to follow it, they're required to not follow it and to report it. This situation, the situation that doctor finds himself in, is a situation where he's being told to do something which is not legal. And he's got to decide what's the best thing to do now. Do I go along and report it later? Do I go along and not report it? Do I say, no, I'm drawing the line? It's another interesting question, which is, if these people are being tortured as a doctor, should I keep them alive? Knowing that the only reason I'm being asked to keep them alive is to continue the torture? Should I then let them die? Should I try to stop the torture? It's a difficult situation he finds himself in. Uh, and again, I think his response is based in his inexperience as much as anything else. Um, but what are people's responsibilities? How do we hold them accountable for their actions? Even taking into account the circumstances. Do the circumstances mitigate all personal responsibility? I don't think so. Maybe this is where you get into a distinction between guilt and then what's an appropriate sanction or punishment for violations and crimes. Maybe you say you're guilty, but given your circumstances, I'm going to find a greater or lesser penalty or sanction for you because of the circumstances. How does that factor in? It might not factor into the guilt or innocence, but it might factor into the punishment phase. Lots to weigh here, obviously. But look, get through the reading first. Again, we've still got plenty of time. This thing's not due for another week. Today is Wednesday. The 31st is Halloween. You got till next Wednesday. Read through all the materials. Think about it. Read the case study. Uh, and again, start working on a response. Start working on an essay. Um, once you feel like you got a handle on what are the big issues at play. Anyway, take care. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.